And we uh, have the, the honor and the pleasure to, to get some late input, uh, which is sort of less technical, which I would say, and much more optimistic, maybe. Uh, Harold James will give us a talk um, about uh, a new golden age of globalization that he thinks may come up after the pandemic. And that would be a great thing uh, and something we are happy to think about at the end of this day. And I would uh, perhaps immediately um, ask uh, Harold in a second um, to start his talk and then we will have a, a small discussion on this uh, to end this day. And uh, thanks again to all the participants of the fiscal panel and uh, the former ones. We had a brilliant afternoon, I think, about all these issues. Thank you and see you soon. Yes, please, Harold, um, uh, you are known, I, we have been together for, for some sessions already, you've participated in a lot of our events, and I don't need to present you a much more um, uh, brilliant thinker also about all these uh, paradigm shifting things that we are discussing about. Uh, and now you have some thoughts to share about um, this perspective of globaliz for globalization, please. Harold, go ahead. Well, th th thank you so much, uh, Thomas. It's really been wonderful being with you uh, all day and uh, listening to this fascinating discussion. Um, uh, and thank you, Martin, for moderating that, that uh, great debate that we've just had. Um, so what I wanted to do was to give you something, you know, maybe a little bit different in terms of a optimistic scenario uh, but it's also, I think, a challenging one, and it highlights many of the issues that you've been thinking about uh, over the course of the afternoon. Um, the, the, the ideas that I'm going to present very, very briefly um, relate to an article that I did in Foreign Affairs in the most recent issue of Foreign Affairs on globalization's uh, coming golden age. And it's thinking very much in terms of the long-term issues that you thought about already uh, this morning when you uh, started and in the early afternoon, uh, when you listened to Mark Blythe and Eric Lonergan, uh, thinking about the long-term uh, return on capital uh, across the world and this apparently inexorable movement uh, of interest rates downwards. Um, to some extent, uh, what I'm thinking of uh, comes from the same kind of idea of thinking about a long-term trajectory, uh, but it's also thinking about what happens to G, um, what happens to growth. And one of the key themes that you had in the afternoon uh, was thinking about what's necessary uh, to push growth, because unless you push growth, uh, you will really have the difficulties with the sustainability of debt and uh, the, the, the whole of uh, the public financial uh, structure uh, comes into question and it gets attacked by bond markets and so on. Um, th th this is a, a picture that's, that's taken from a nice recent pa paper by uh, Maury Oaksfeld and uh, Katow uh, on globalization, global exports to GDP. And you can see that there are really two big surges of globalization um, and they're not automatic. And that's the thing that I really wanted to point to. Uh, they're not automatic. Uh, they come about and you know, it's not a long-term necessary trend. Uh, it comes about because of particular ruptures and particular shocks. Um, and so I wanted to look at those two globalization pushes that I think have been definitive. And I think they have similarities with the age that we're in at the moment. So uh, there are stories of shortages and um, there are stories, if you like, of supply shocks. Um, uh, and uh, I think you know, one of the best ways of thinking about the COVID crisis is not as a demand shock. It's not a really analogous to the 2008 uh, financial crisis, but it's a supply shock. Um, so the 1840s, um, all over Europe, but also in, uh, in uh, Asia, uh, were a period of food shortages um, and 
as a result of the food shortages, uh, collapse of demand and uh, manufacturing crisis. Um, and uh, the question was how to respond uh, to those food shortages. Um, the Europeans realized quickly in discussing it that they couldn't really grow enough food themselves. They need to get food from somewhere else. Um, they need to expand their links to Eastern Europe, to the Russian Empire, to North America, to South America. Uh, they need, in short, uh, to globalize. Um, the 1970s, um, the other globalization uh, push, and uh, it was interesting, I thought, striking in the last session that Anna Maria uh, Simonazzi um, mentioned the 1970s as a parallel. And I think many people are now looking at the 1970s and thinking what, what is similar. Uh, oil uh, shortages, spikes in other commodities, including food. Uh, what do we have today? Uh, we have a shortage, shortages in areas that are really uh, bottlenecks, uh, Chippegadon, uh, but Chippegadon is spreading its impact to other areas. So what briefly uh, were the reactions to this? Um, I think along three dimensions, um, a demand for the increased effectiveness of state action, uh, the, the core functions of the state after a period of profound political turbulence. The 1840s, well, it ended with the revolutions of 1848 and a remaking of government um, across Europe. Uh, the 1970s were a period of the challenge to democracy. Um, uh, uh, the, famous book by Jean-François Revelle on how democracies perish and um, how to make democracies more effective. They need to be, uh, they need to be uh, more appropriate. Um, new financing techniques in both cases, um, uh, really radical transformation of financing. And then and related to both the financing and the question of the effectiveness of state action, looking uh, to foreign models, for how things are handled better. And so countries are looking at each other and learning from each other. And you see that, I mean, I think particularly the poster childs of this, uh, the, the examples of this are the way in the uh, middle of the 19th century, uh, Germany and Japan learned institutionally uh, from what was going on in uh, Western Europe. And, um, it, you know, as an extension to this, um, uh, Thomas asked me uh, to think about how, in particular, you could draw lessons for this, for your theme for today, uh, on how Germany is supposed to fit into this picture. Um, and uh, I, I have uh, four brief dimensions uh, to, to that. Um, one is, uh, you know, this was already a big theme since 2016, that uh, some people thought that Germany should have a greater responsibility for managing globalization in the wake of the defections from globalization, as it were, in the United States with the Trump election and in the UK uh, with the Brexit referendum. Um, uh, building uh, global institutions uh, is important thinking of global tax rules. Um, you know, th these are areas where there's a substantial amount of progress uh, being made. Um, thinking, and this is a theme that echoed right through the afternoon, thinking about the effectiveness of government spending, who can judge where it's most effectively being spent, and not thinking anymore in terms of aggregate demand stimuluses, of aggregate demand shortfalls, uh, but thinking in particular of targeting expenditure uh, so that it's going to produce higher levels of growth in the future. And two areas, I think, that came out in the discussions, and I agreed with both of them, uh, were the, the story of trying to do Bidenomics in the, in the European setting. In other words, um, putting more into childcare um, and education in order to release more people into working in the workforce. And you know, this was a critical issue that was highlighted uh, by the pandemic. But I think secondly, and with a longer term consequence as well, uh, is the idea, and uh, you, you had this very much in the last session, but Guntram uh, Wolf put it very prominently, uh, is to um, manage the transition 
uh, to an environmental sustainability uh, and to uh, the use of non-carbon energies. Um, the embrace of disruptive technologies, I think, is much more difficult for Germany, um, maybe for Europe as a whole, but uh, particularly for Germany. And you know, there's a kind of historic path dependency there uh, that uh, Germany is very, very good uh, historically in making small incremental changes uh, to existing technologies. But there's also a need for radical new technologies um, and, uh, in a sense, you know, a century or more of work on the internal combustion engine just needs to be thrown out of the window. Um, and you need to think of something, something completely different. Um, there's obviously a capacity uh, for doing that. There's a capacity in terms of intellectual research, uh, but what's lacking in Europe, uh, and I, 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 you know, this is obviously very much an outsider's uh, point is uh, that you need the structures of the capital market, venture capital, uh, you know, you've had dramatic successes. You think of the story of BioNTech, it's really wonderful, uh, but you need much more like this um, in order to really make this transition. And uh, BioNTech, I think, is a fascinating mixture of government action. Uh, there's, there's the initial investment from the Bundesforschungsministerium program, um, and then uh, capital from the existing pharmaceutical industry, um, but you need to think of ways in which that can be done. And, you know, I think some of the ventures, obviously, uh, you know, there's no need to, to, to hark on the disasters that you've had when you had uh, the, the belief that fintech was going to uh, be transformative, but then this dramatic bet that Wirecard is the right way of doing it. Uh, you, you need to think in general. Uh, of ways of getting outside the framework of the traditional financial structures in terms of producing economic growth. And then the, uh, the final point that I would make, like to make when I put this to the comparison uh, and to, to also in a way to building the bridge from today's discussion to tomorrow's discussion uh, on the central uh, uh, bank and uh, on central banking problems, um, you know, I think uh, if you look at these globalization surges from the middle of the 19th century or from the 1970s, uh, they were accompanied by a substantial measure of inflation, much more in the 1970s uh, than in the 1850s, but substantial inflation in the 1850s as well. And inflation um, is actually, in some ways, I think, uh, something that we should think more in depth about, um, because inflation is, is used as a term that masks a whole series of market signals. Um, and some of the market signals that we're seeing at the moment in terms of rising prices are things that we shouldn't actually worry about. So the rising prices for com computer chips, um, well, that's going to push for more investment. It's a signal to which the markets should respond. Um, and you will find more investment. And then in the long term, uh, you would expect the prices to come down again. So, uh, you know, price rises highlight bottlenecks. Uh, but the other one is really more serious. Um, uh, what about energy prices? Uh, shouldn't market signals really be a crucial part of signaling the transition uh, to a different energy future? And if that's the case, um, we should expect energy prices to be higher because we want them to affect consumers' behavior. Uh, we want to get less energy intensive consumption. Uh, in order to do that, uh, you need to, uh, you, you really need to, to, to make people pay more. And uh, this, this isn't something that's undesirable. And if this is put into a CPI index and you see energy prices rising uh, very dramatically, um, and you get worried about it as a result, and you think that you need to break uh, economic activity and limit the uh, revival, uh, the recovery from the COVID crisis, um, th that I think is a way of making a, a big, big uh, policy mistake. Uh, so, you know, the final and I think most controversial bit of this, most difficult to respond to um, is uh, that we really need to rethink the way in which we approach the issue of inflation and the, the measurement 
of CPI, and we might want to take those goods, those items of consumption that we think of as destructive and unsustainable uh, out of a CPI, um, out of a recast CPI, in order to make uh, for a, a, an approach to the balance of monetary and fiscal policy uh, that is actually compatible and sustainable uh, with the long-term uh, goals that we're setting ourselves in this, in this moment. Well, I, I promise not to talk for all the time because we wanted to have some kind of uh, discussion and uh, Thomas, I think uh, you're, you're going to uh, manage the discussion as wonderfully and as effectively as you always do. Um, oh, th <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, the, the easy task is now that we wanted to have a discussion between the two of us, so it's uh, easy to manage. For, uh, I mean, uh, not so complex. But if any uh, question arises, uh, and there's uh, questions in, in the audience chat, uh, please feel free uh, give us a signal to, to, to do this. Um, uh, excellent idea. The, the one you finished, I will keep in mind and we will ask, uh, ask tomorrow Isabel Schnabel, uh, if that's a good idea, I think it's it sounds like a real good idea to um, to not count uh, the bad prices, uh, the, the price that we want to be higher, uh, right. because that's exactly what we have already now in Germany. I mean, the higher inflation that we have in the last couple of months uh, is partly due to the introduction of the CO2 pricing. So, and that's that would be crazy if the central bank reacts to that and. Um, so in that way, uh, already something uh, very good to, and we will uh, hope to, to remember tomorrow to talk, to ask that uh, to Isabel or, or maybe Laurence Tubiana. Um, I would really like to um, to check what uh, historical examples, and you're the expert on, on that, are telling us uh, all these crises. Um, I mean, there may be counter examples on the one hand and the other question that I would have is compared to the crisis that you describe in history is the pandemic even if it sounds cynical but is that serious enough to have such a big impact in, in on such a thing like globalization yes I mean I, I, I think it is it is very serious and um... It, 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 it's fascinating, actually, that the first response to the uh, pandemic uh, was to think uh, that globalization is at fault. And it was clear that, you know, at first, uh, the first places that were affected by the pandemic were very, very globalized places. Uh, so it was uh, Lombardy in, in, in Europe, uh, the, the, the kind of dynamic industrial hub around uh, Milan, um, uh, the west coast of the United States, um, uh, New York. Um, and uh, it's, 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 some people in the Trump administration went around saying this, this just shows that we were right all along that globalism and globalization are, are, are dangerous. Uh, Peter Navarro uh, talked about uh, globalization as the original sin. And the thought was that you can protect yourself by cutting off all the links to, uh, to globalization um, and uh, obviously reduce travel and do that as a long-term uh, effort, uh, but also reduce your dependence on foreign supplies. And uh, so th there was a lot of, and there is a lot of uh, vaccine nationalism and people think that they need to be self-sufficient. And you know, to some extent, you, know, you might just be able to do that uh, in the United States, though I think it's actually almost impossible even there. Uh, but in European countries, even in large European countries like Germany, uh, but not to speak, you know, if you think of uh, vaccine nationalism and you know, producing all the pharmaceuticals that you need in Slovenia or Estonia, it's, it's clearly a non-starter. Um, and uh, you know, I think when when uh, uh, people look at uh, how Moderna or uh, Pfizer BioNTech actually produce their vaccines, they see that they're dependent on very very extensive supply chains, and you need the planes to keep on flying all the bits and pieces uh, to to uh, to link up. So, you know, in that sense, uh, the, the 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 crisis uh, shows. Uh, you know, the necessity of global connections, but it also shows 
I think the necessity of effective government responses, and you've seen very, very divergent responses on this. So, uh, you know, I think if you if you take uh, two examples outside um, uh, the, the, the North Atlantic framework, if you take uh, Brazil or India, um, the, the pandemic really shows a very, very harsh light on the competence of the uh, Modi government or of the Bolsonaro government. But it also uh, it was, uh, I, I think, you know, very, very poorly handled in the United States last year, and uh, that played a role in the in the in the election. Uh, it, it was poorly handled in the in the UK last year. Uh, Dominic Cummings was testifying today about that in the in the House of Commons. Um, and uh, you know, you're 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 going to see a demand as a result for smart governments and governments that can respond smartly and efficiently uh, will be rewarded. Um, in in the political aftermath of this pandemic, and being smart in this uh, does really uh, involve coordinating supply chains across countries. Uh, that's that's an essential element of the smartness. Mm. You've been talking about building global institutions. Um, I try to imagine. I mean, I'm if you have look at the Second World War or what happened afterwards, there was the you know the big uh, Bretton Woods conference, which established as one part, certainly, but as a main part, the post-war institutions on a global level. And that sort of was the start of some decades of uh, global institutions or institutionalized globalization in a way or regulated. Um, what could be something like this? I mean, imagining that there will be a, a Bretton Woods conference some at some point after the pandemic seems quite difficult to imagine. What, what would you think? I, I, I mean, w w what I would think you would uh, want to think about is exactly the combination of health measures uh, with um, sustainability measures um, with also the security issues. Um, and, you know, I think what, what was interesting in those conferences in 1944 and 1945 was that indeed there was a, a bundling of all those issues and people recognized that um, peace and political stability were impossible without economic security throughout the world. And that was impossible without political rights. And you couldn't be just peaceful or economically secure in one part of the world. And, uh, you know, that, that was one of the inspirational addresses at the at the Bretton Woods conference when the Treasury Secretary Morgenthau uh, said that uh, peace and security are indivisible. Uh, you, you know, we can't be peaceful on our own. And, you know, that clearly applies, I think, to the story of uh, the vaccines um, and uh, the health measures at the moment that we can do well in the United States or in uh, the UK or in, in in Europe. I think you're you're making really good progress on the vaccines but it, it it's not enough it needs to be everywhere and uh, you know that, that 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 challenge is 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 really a critical one and it it, it requires uh, coordination mm. um just to to get to to germany and the the you know outlook for for germany we have had this discussion in september um given that germany has been probably one of certainly one of the most uh, um, positively affected uh, countries um, from the last push of globalization in 1990s uh, 2000s what would you expect if that comes true and if there's a global age of globalization will germany be among the first ones again to profit from from this development well, I, I, I mean, that, that was the, 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 the issue that I was trying to think about briefly, um, because many of the industries that are going to be at the center are really quite different to the industries of the past. And so, um, you, you know, I, th I think it's, it's still a kind of open question. Um, uh, you know, can the German automobile industry, which was an enormously important part of the German economic success, can you adjust to a, a world in which mobility is considered in very, very different ways? Um, you, you know, at the moment you see stock market valuations that 
put Tesla as uh, worth much more than General Motors or Volkswagen. Um, you know, obviously there are techniques uh, that are important from the old in, in industrial uh, era, but uh, you, you really need to to have an adaptation. And um, you know, I think the the, the issue of getting a, getting new ventures, uh, startup capital, um, uh, pioneers, um, and you, you know, I think you know, part of the story is motivating people. And uh, you know, fortunately, you you have in 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 the story of BioNTech a kind of wonderful motivation story. And uh, you really want to ask yourself, uh, you know, shouldn't there be more versions of this? And uh, is isn't this what we need uh, r rather than um, you know just allowing the the big enterprises of the past uh, to, to go on. Uh, it, 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 it's really a very disruptive age that we're in. And uh, you know, some of that disruption is, 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 is very uncomfortable for people. Um, uh, and you know, I, I think there's a, there's a preference for many people and you know, certainly in Germany for stability. Uh, but uh, you know, what, what uh, the pandemic has done, in a way I don't think the global financial crisis did, is to give you a kind of wake up call and say technology is more important. We need to think of new ways of communicating and uh, we need to think of more ways of responding to that, how to manage data. And um, you know, in, 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 in that regard, um, you know, thinking about how data is handled, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I thought one of the crucial things is to think, you know, how other countries manage this and, uh, you know, clearly you have a different set of priorities about the handling of data in Europe than you do in the United States or in, in Asia. And uh, you know, that's, that's one of the issues that will be up, up for grabs, I think, in the, in the future. Thanks a lot, um, Harold. 